So you wanna know the secrets to making a rotary engine reliable? Well, I'll tell you what, they really aren't secrets. They are the basics. And one of the coolest things about YouTube is that you can take all of my years of experience and then condense it into a video like this. And I can share that with you. And so you get to save all the years and frustration understanding how to make this engine way more reliable than it actually is. There are a lot of misconceptions and this video assumes that you know the basic concept of this engine. This video assumes that you've seen the GIFs where you see the engine doing triangle shapes. You know it doesn't go up and down like a piston engine. It assumes you know the memes about apex seals breaking and all that. And so we're gonna start and talk right about how to make this engine reliable. It is not about how to tune it. It's not how to, about to build it. It's about how it is built that can make this engine so much more reliable and make so much more power than people assumed. Mazda was put in a really shitty position Position when they created this engine and it has to do with the exhaust I believe that emissions and making this engine interesting to people that don't understand rotary engines were both the reason the engine worked and its ultimate downfall as to being considered a good engine what am I doing here that's working somehow obviously I don't have a race team or anything like that why is random ass dude that used to do computers doing so well with engines not blowing up and making tons of power let's go through all the major problems of the design of the engine and what you can do to solve them relatively easy and continue on without having to buy tons of random weird shit. This is our favorite lovely little rotor. And these are all rotors with a different type of problem that have occurred. And I will be harping on this the most. This is carbon deposits. It's that crap. Just like when I was at Valvoline's engine lab last month, all these deposits are a major no on rotary engines. There's a couple major causes. One of them being coolant getting into the engine as well as regular gas. This is another really fun one. You would think that this is the problem I'm gonna point out and that's from detonation, that's denting of the rotors. But that's actually not as big of a problem as you think it is. It's a result, but not as much of a problem. The thing I brought this rotor out for was actually a very small issue right here. That little edge of wear is not good at all. That means that this engine was wobbling and the rotor actually touched the housing. The rotor touched the side of the motor. They kissed and that is not good for race engines. Finally, is this third rotor here has a lot of pitting. I've cleaned it off, wire brushed it and done all that. Not the vertical lines, but the actual dots on this. That's from coolant rusting on there. We're going to talk more about that type of problem as well. We start getting into more of the more insane types of problems with the engine. And again, here comes our best friend, the coolant system. Now you may have seen a vehicle that we just got running this week and you saw the beautiful white smoke trailing behind it. Yes, that is Isaiah's RX-8 and it's not just an RX-8 thing, it's a rotary thing where the coolant traveling inside of this area is able to get into here. This is one of the coolant seals. That's where all this rust comes from and the engine ignites or attempts to ignite it and it turns to vapor. It's not water, it's glycol and water. That creates that wild white smoke and of course drains your coolant. On the other hand, this engine also suffered the same problem on the outside. Coolant was somehow able to get past the outer coolant seal and leak. If either of these seals break and go down into the oil pan, you'll actually see your oil turn into this like milky, frothy stuff. It doesn't taste good, it's not a good milkshake. I wouldn't recommend it. Coolant seals to me are a major problem of the engine and also the best problem to have because the engine's not actually broken. If you notice, we loaded all four of us and my mate fancied a skid in the parking lot here with his RX-8. The engine was running just fine. We'll talk more about how to resolve that. This is one of my favorites because this is when you start making power you start cracking what are called the irons. This is cast iron. As the name suggests, there's cracks in it. This area right here is also kind of this area up here. These areas crack and there is 120 PSI oil sitting in there ready to be free. Finally, everybody's favorite, the rotor housing. You can see down here, the rotor housing has been under some extreme wear and that can actually be from lubrication of the apex seals as well as there's some chatter marks. This is perfectly fine. The thing's actually still running slightly lower compression, but we'll talk about the proper ways to avoid that infamous problem. That starts to get into the issues with this here. This is a tension bolt. It just tensions the motor this way. Also, dowels. This is a stock Mazda dowel pin and I heard somebody say this once before and it stuck so well with me. They call it a locating pin. And I would actually like that name more because what you're really doing is locating the pieces together with this. And then asshats like me are using that locating pin to try and hold the engine together. That is where you set yourself up for some heartbreak. These can crack. It's very hard to see, but this one is actually cracked. There's a hairline crack 
right somewhere in here, it actually will start to fight, like right there, it's, it's binding off. It's not circular anymore, so it's hollow because oil needs to pass through that, and we'll talk about some of the upgrades for that. And then every internet meme, this is the infamous Apex seal. Well, at least 90% of it anyway. This is a stock two-piece Apex seal with 100% of its piece on there. This is the most common problem you can have when you are upgrading and tuning a rotary engine. These are not as bad as you think they are, but they are kind of the canary in the mine shaft when the engine starts having problems. This corner chips off and then that goes through the engine and in a beautiful rinse cycle, rips up this housing, rips up the rotors and can also destroy your turbo. That one actually did. That is when that little chunk broke off and then it kissed the wall, just destroyed everything. This is another wonderful thing. We've covered this already, but these are bearings. This is a bearing where I had some metal inside of my oil coolers and that metal then went into the bearings. Obviously metal going into any engine is bad. So it's not rotary specific, but I wanted to show you that. Over here is corner seals. So this and this are stock corner seals. This one has the rubber still in it, but that rubber starts to eat away like this if you have ethanol. We'll talk about why that's not as bad as you think it is. This one right here is a corner seal on meth. Actually, it's not. It's a corner seal on detonation. You can see that it cracked the corner seal in pieces. Normally, it'll crack kind of at the really weak spot down here, but that one cracked up at the top, and it did a nasty number on that. In the same vein, these are apex seal springs. These go underneath the apex seal and hold it to the housing. That looks like a normal one. It's not. It's actually flattened. We take a look at this one. This one looks almost like a normal one. It's not. That one's been shortened. It looks like it's meant to be, which is what's confusing, but it actually broke off. It hit this corner here, flattened, and then broke a little chunk off, and then that chunk goes flying as well. Finally, this one is over years of incorrect wear. It starts to flatten the seal out. It wears it down here, and it gets thinner. Apex seal springs do wear out over time. Those are all the major problems of a rotary engine. Let's talk about the solutions, because all of those have beautiful solutions and I don't think that there's one video that just clearly says, here's how to fix a rotary engine. Your tuner can screw all this up too. Your builder can build this incorrectly, but this is the inherent design to the engine. And here's how to fix almost everything. This disclaimer is this does not necessarily help you with emissions. A lot of these will not affect emissions. So if you're trying to keep your engine bone stock, you can almost do almost all of these mods and get all of the upgrade and uh, none of you worry about not passing emissions. Probably one of the biggest killers to me, which is all of this nasty carbon shit here. Now, I would love to show you why this carbon shit matters, but my my torch, my butane torch is missing. And that's what you, you get when you're surrounded by guys that smoke weed in the shop. What happens is these sections of carbon are almost like little candles that hold a little bit of heat. And instead of you just having spark plugs, you now have these little chunks of carbon that are holding in heat and can cause the gas to pre-ignite before it was supposed to. That causes the engine to jerk backwards or try to, and then everything gets destroyed. You get dense, you get apex seals to break. The corner seals get flattened into a point where you can't even remove them. The rotor wobbles. Those are all major problems when you have that happen. So how do you solve this? Well, first of all, E85. E85 is something that I saw a lot of the old guys on the forum saying, oh man, it's gunking up all these engines. And there's a little bit of gunk. Let me show you this. This is a rotor that was running some E85, but then crankcase oil got into it. These are the rotors from the four rotor. They're perfectly fine, not touched. There's no cleaning done to these. You can see the oil's falling out of it still. These are perfectly fine. This is E85 and premix with it. That's what comes out of the engine. There is no shit to pre-ignite on this. It's a wonderful thing. All of the issues that I've seen people complain or worry about with E85 are honestly bullshit. E85 has cooling properties not only intake temperature cooling, but also cooling like engine cooling, like radiator cooling. The engine does not run nearly as hot, as well as timing issues that you can actually go more aggressive in timing. That's why you make more power with the 85 than regular gas. Regular gas has a lot of random impurities, random shit in it. If you're trying to instantly make this engine that much more reliable, that is the biggest thing that you can do. Obviously you can't just swap E85 into it. That requires aftermarket electronics. That is hands down the biggest thing that a rotary engine benefits from. Second major one, pre-mixing. Let's look at this stuff right here. You guys know I almost basically use this as mouthwash. This is Valvine's VR1 2050 full synthetic oil. 
Everything that makes this oil amazing at what it does is everything that makes it bad for a rotary engine. Whoa, hold on. You're working with Valvoline. You use it. Why are you saying it's bad? This oil is meant to sit in that beautiful oil pan down there or your dry sump tank and lubricate these bearings, lubricate the E-shaft, lubricate these gears on the sides of these rotors. It is the best stuff, arguably the absolute best stuff in my opinion for rotary engines. There's an inherent flaw to rotary engines that make that the engine's worst nightmare. That is right here. This little hole does in fact go into the engine. A lot of you already know some of this. That is an oil metering pump. That is an oil injection hole. It actually sucks up oil from the crankcase. And of course, I'm sure not all of you use Valvoline, so you're even using any other type of oil. That oil is being sucked up from down there and being injected into the engine here to lubricate the apex seals. So these apex seals don't get lubrication any other way. And so now you've got this being lubricated there. Well, what's going on? That's exactly where the gas is going. And so you're taking oil that is formulated to stay under 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and now you're burning it. And I would argue, and I could be wrong, but I would argue that the better the oil is, the worse that that would create deposits because now you have all the zinc, phosphorus, all these other cleaning agents. Those are meant to stay under a certain temperature and do their job, not be ignited. So the second major thing I would do is not cough syrup or lean. <laughs> this is a two stroke oil. This is an oil that is literally meant to be ignited. Just like a weed whacker, this oil is designed to lubricate but also combust cleanly or at least it's much cleaner than this. This stuff would probably suck ass as crankcase oil. It would never touch Valvoline on doing what it needs to do for high RPMs and whatnot. This stuff would suck but for lubricating apex seals, pre-mixing with two-stroke oil, whether it's the stuff meant for gasoline or E85, is the second major solution, major solution to rotary engine reliability. So number one is E85, number two is pre-mixing oil. Disconnect and block off your oil metering pump that was designed to make a rotary engine a consumer-based engine. It was meant to get it into a lot of people's hands. And sadly, that was both the rotary engine's opportunity to live and, and its ultimate downfall, I believe, is that you're increasing the amount of shit that's going into the engine itself. It's just a horrible thing. Some RX-8s, you can actually disconnect that system and have it basically pull from a little bucket and have the engine premix for you. But most of us, we're like scientists pouring that into your gas tank when you're filling up or premixing it into my one ethanol. Premix and E85 are two of the biggest engine improvements. But let's talk about how the engine's built. The next major thing, you clearance the corners on the rotor. And that's something that a lot of people are really secretive about for no fucking reason, I'm not gonna lie. Not to me, just in general. This is done out in New Zealand and Australia. They put it on a lathe and they take this corner and they bring it up about five thousandths, uh, I think collectively on both sides. So it's whatever this size is, two and a half thousandths or so, they narrow it down. And that happens when the rotor is in here and it's spinning like this, right? Well, it's on a gear and then it starts getting so much power that it wiggles as the combustion is so insane and you'll actually rub against the side of the engine. If you were to rub hard enough, you know, that would cause friction. That would be devastating. Race clearance in. The next major thing, which is related to that same issue, is talking about how do you prevent the rotors from wobbling as much. And of course, having higher oil pressure would definitely help that. The FD actually has pretty high oil pressure from the factory, but that little bit more, getting it up to 110, 120 is actually pretty solid. Let's talk about the oil system in general. There are a couple major flaws with the stock engine. This plate right here with this modification makes this crack not matter. This is actually, I think, a decode 20B. This is supposed to be the strongest plate Mazda made for a three rotor. The issue is they crack here and they crack there, like I said earlier. So the solution is say, screw it. We know that these will crack. Let's not allow oil to go through here. And so one of the best mods that you can do, hands down, is what's called an external oil mod, where you have oil coming in you basically have your hoses split from oil and then go out to the front bearing, the middle bearing, the rear bearing, the turbo, all of that. So you avoid having oil going through here. So if there's no oil through here, this can crack all you want and the engine's fine. Why does this crack? You've solved the result that it can crack and you go, this is sitting in here trying to do its job. This comes down to the next major issue, which is tension bolts do one thing and they do it decently well. 
but they aren't supposed to do only one thing. This is something that I think Mazda maybe 30 years ago made a compromise on or just realized that, hey, for 200, 300 horsepower, this is not necessary. This is the tension bolt. The tension bolt is straight up designed to sandwich the thing together like this, but as you make power, the engine doesn't give a shit about coming out like this anymore because the tension bolt's doing its job. It starts to do this. Sitting in front of all that horsepower and torque is two of these just going, well, shit, I picked the wrong job to do. And there's not enough of them. These being hollow, they crack, like I said earlier, without modifying the engine too much, you can A, move to a longer version of that, or B, the granddaddy of them all, a 16 millimeter solid dowel. So you'll hear when people say, oh, you're solid doweling the motor, you're actually kind of doing two things at once. One is you're now making a dowel go through that block there. And two, you have to do the external oil mod because oil can't transfer through a solid piece of metal. Pineapple Racing sells actual stuff machined and ground for that exact. This is raw, I'd get it from machine shops, it's a lot cheaper, but I have to do a lot of work too. I would do a solid dowel kit. That would be a major, major upgrade as you start making power. But there are a couple upgrades for the tension bolt itself. I hate to say this, and these are really good friends of mine, but this is a kit from Atkins. Atkins does a lot of things very well, but this, this I don't think has the place in my shop where I would want it. This kit comes with a drill bit and a thread to make these threads larger, that they don't fit on there now, that comes with a tap. It doesn't solve the problem that I was trying to solve. You look at the stock dowel, that is doing nothing in the way of preventing torsion or rotation or bulging or anything like that, it's doing zero. Well, this sadly doesn't do much better. It's stronger, it's gonna keep that clamped in stronger, so that's a major upgrade. But you're modifying your engine and you're already doing all this work and you're not addressing the, the issue there. Upgrade, if you got these, they're not too expensive either. I, I would consider them, but honestly to me, not worth the, the money. This is basically an ARP bolt, Turbo makes this. This is a wonderful upgrade and this actually solves the same problem in a different way. It says, screw it, let's keep these threads, the stock thread, right? but let's make it much stronger bolt. It is slightly thicker than the stock one, so it does require no machining, but it, it doesn't solve this problem, but they are stronger in many other ways. The thing that these are really good for is upgrading your setup a little bit like this. Now you've got a thing sitting inside of your dowels, you machine the dowel out, and you've got the tension this way and the dowel is preventing torsion this way. That requires you to machine big hole like this into the block. That is honestly the beginning, one of the best upgrades that you can do for the engine is studding slash doweling the block. That's where my original knowledge ended, but it wasn't until I bought an engine from New Zealand where my mind was fully blown and the guy said, you know what? That's cool. These are two pieces. You've got a stud and a dowel. What they did is they actually made dowel studs where it was all one piece of metal, 16 millimeters thick here with small step down threads on each end. And then they machined the engine for this thicker 16 millimeter thing. And boom, I think the greatest solution for high horsepower on a rotor engine was born. And that is these beefy things making this engine into a jail cell for those rotors. The torsion isn't there, it's locked into place. Sadly, I learned from the shop that did this. If they're this loose, that's not helping you either. So you want to make sure that you have the engine when you dowel it to have the precision that I did actually on my three rotor. If I can do it, honestly, a professional machine shop should be able to do that even better than me. So they should, shouldn't be press fit, but should definitely be a little bit of work to get them through the whole motor. That is hands down one of the greatest upgrades for making tons of power on an engine, leaving everything else almost stock. So we talked about E85, pre-mixing, external oiling mod and doweling. That's it. If you're asking how does this ass hat make so much power without having a race team behind him, that's my secret. There is no secret. It's right in front of you this entire time. And I will tell you, there are a lot of modifications that people do to the engines that are useless, even to a person at my power level. So for example, I'm gonna call it what it is. You'll see companies rip off like racing beats thing where they machine and add surface area to all these things. If you're not making the power that I'm making, do not waste your money on that modification. Absolutely useless. Further yet, when you're talking about four rotors, I can run water straight to that whole engine and it come out almost as cold. That disproves everybody's theory about the heat absorption. No, you're, that's, that's a lie. Don't, don't do that mod. I'm sure it has a good place in their heart, but scalloping rotors, lightning rotors, none of that shit is necessary getting up to the level of power I am. Do they do something? Yes, absolutely they do. But do you need that? Do you need to waste that money on that? And if you had a broken part on the engine, do you need to have to buy all that again? 
You don't. I will tell you right now, you don't. Something we'll cover really uh, in a very controversial video is Apex seals. I'm very careful not to tell you guys which Apex seals I'm using because I'm using a lot of different companies' Apex seals. I'm testing them. And with that, I put my money where my mouth is and I rented an X-ray scanner, an XRF scanner if you guys are looking for it, and it tells you exactly what metals are inside of Apex seals. So I went and bought all different types and I scanned them because you know what? I'm tired of bullshit in the rotary community and I can tell you exactly what they're all made of. I don't know how much of that information I'll share. I don't want to put a target on my back, but I will tell you what I find. And I'll, I might even on the six or I might run six different Apex seals and show you guys all of them running different things together. But Apex seals, aftermarket seals, they almost all do a decent job and they solve this problem. They have their own other problems, but you can basically just buy an aftermarket seal and it gives you a little bit more insurance for those detonation moments. If you don't detonate your motor, you never have this problem. Corner seals, same thing. They're kind of the canary in the mine shaft. They tell you when the engine's having problems. Anytime I've broken one, it's because of doing anti-lag at 40 PSI, both on the three and four row. Just like these springs here, they're wear items. So these are different things that can happen to them, but replace them. Stock springs behind everything, stock corner seals, stock side seals, not stock apex seals, but you can still run those to a considerable amount of power. There's no magic pieces here. There's nothing I'm hiding in there. You have a solid engine now, with basic upgrades that can be replaced if you have weird problems with your tuning or your building or you make a mistake, you get a solid set of sensors, get a solid timing wheel, get a solid ECU, make sure your fuel's clean, and you can make an insane amount of power reliably with these engines. We're actually gonna put my money where my mouth is. We have E85 on it right now. We're gonna take this block out and machine it for short little dowel studs, put it back together and show you that that's exactly how we can make 700 horsepower of this engine without worrying about it. I just wanna show you why I choose certain modifications to do and why there's science behind why they 